If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1. The title of the message, The Savior is Born. So we've been going through now the Gospel of Matthew. And we're going to look at more than just... Um, let's start with Luke's Gospel. How about that? Luke, chapter 1. What we're going to do is we're going to jump back and forth between Luke's Gospel and Matthew's Gospel. So we'll start with Luke chapter 1. And then understand that this is the, um, the way I've approached this. So Jesus is born. He comes into the world. But there's all these people around him. All these people that God is revealing this Savior to. And I thought it was significant because you have people on all different spectrums. You have many that are pious and religious and God-fearing. And then you have some that are religious and really want nothing to do with Jesus. And then you have these people that have no business, if you will, um, receiving this incredible blessing. Not that anyone is worthy of it. But again, just the dynamic as I was reading through both of these books and, and just everything that surrounded the birth of the Savior. And so you have this Messiah, the Christ. Christ is anointed one and it means Messiah. Um, promise from the Old Testament. But you have all these people. And so I thought it was significant that, wow, okay, Lord, you're revealing yourself to some but you're not revealing yourself to others. And what's the dynamic there? And that's what we're going to look at this morning as we see a Savior is born. Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, this time of year is just the blessing that you came into this world at some point in time. You were born, Lord, in a manger in lowly circumstances. You, you came and you were born to die. And so, Lord, we have the birth, the death, and the resurrection proclaiming the gospel. Thank you so much for your word. Speak to us now, Lord, as we offer this time up to you. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear what your spirit says to the church this morning. In Jesus' name and all of God's children said, Amen. Let's start in Luke's gospel, chapter 1, at verse 26. And what we're going to do is we're going to see the angel come to Mary, the mother of Jesus, and you're going to see a lot of fear surrounding just what's taking place. I don't know how you would feel if an angel visited you or an angel came to you in a dream, but it's a majestic being. It's something to behold, I would imagine. And you're thinking, am I in trouble? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> just it's got to be some, some trepidation there, just this angelic being that God has created to be able to announce. So we'll look at Mary's, um, the announcement of the angel to Mary, and then we'll look at uh, the announcement to, to Joseph, Jesus' stepfather. So this is Luke chapter 1, starting at verse 26. Now, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. The sixth month would be the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. And so Elizabeth and Mary would be cousins, and six months prior to this taking place, this announcement that the angel would come to Mary, the, uh, the, the Bible is letting us know that, that Elizabeth is in her sixth month of pregnancy when this takes place. So, uh, sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And so this betrothed period is a legal binding period, but the marriage has yet to be consummated. Three stages in first century AD marriage, that of engagement, that of betroth betrothed or betrothal or whatever that word is, and then consummating the marriage with a ceremony and coming together in a sexual union. And so they're in that second stage before they have come together to consummate the marriage uh, Mary is fully a virgin here, and the Bible is letting us know that because this is a miraculous birth. Verse 28, And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. 
But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. So that's God's grace. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Jesus means uh, Yeshua. It's the same thing as the Hebrew Joshua and it's Savior. It means uh, he came to save. He will be great, verse 32, and will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever in his kingdom. Of his kingdom, there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the holy, that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold the maid, the maid servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Jump now over to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1, and we'll pick it up there at verse 18, where we left off last week. And so in this first account, the angel comes to Mary. Mary is betrothed in a legal state, committed to her husband, Joseph, or her husband-to-be, Joseph. And in that, mm, this birth will um, hover over Mary's head her entire life. There will always be a question of, wow, did she got pregnant before they were married? So there's got to be some shenanigans going on there. And uh, there would be a point in time where um, the religious leaders would accuse Jesus of being a bastard child, a fatherless child, a, uh, not fatherless, but not married uh, when he was born. And so that would hover around Mary her entire life. And so just, again, put yourself in their place. Put yourself in their position. This is a young girl. She's a godly girl. God's grace is upon her. And God is going to use her to bring forth the Savior of the world, the Messiah. But yet, nonetheless, it's not a perfect set of circumstances, as we will see. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1. Let's pick it up at verse 18, where we left off last week. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. His mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph before they came together. She was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. So in the law, the book of Deuteronomy would allow for a divorce. But more than that, Joseph would bring her to the courts and show that she was with child not because of Joseph. She would be considered an adulteress and she would be stoned to death. Joseph, a just man, a righteous man, but yet a gracious man. Not wanting to do that to her. He loved Mary. He was about to marry her. And so in that, he says, man, I'm just going to do this kind of undercover out of respect for Mary. Let her go on with her life, and I'll go ahead and do my life. And yet we see the angel intervenes. Verse 20. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph being aroused from sleep did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. I find it interesting that you have these traditions that go out and 
Again, I don't know why they're developed all the time, but it is believed that Mary would be a perpetual virgin, virgin, not virgin, virgin. And part of that is, for whatever reason, Roman Catholicism has chosen to make Mary a co-redemptress, and nothing could be further from the truth. The Bible says in the book of Timothy that there is one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus. And so, again, some of these traditions, they come out. Uh, we have the one of the three wise men in the scene of the manger, but Jesus is at least eight days old and in the house when the wise men come to visit. And so, I mean, biblically accurate manger scene would not include wise men. You could bring them in after eight days, you know, about January 2nd or something, I don't know, if you'd like to do that. But nonetheless, here we go. We have the account. Moving on now, verses 2 through, let's see these wise men, 2 uh, verse 1 in Matthew's Gospel. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. These wise men are not wise guys. They are truly wise men from Persia, of all places, coming from the east. And they have biblical knowledge that something is taking place in history. God is giving them a sign through the stellar, through the stars, and they're walking in obedience step by step, and God is going to continue to just enlighten them as they move forward in faith. Notice verse 2 saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and co have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. Does King Herod want to uh, worship the king? No, the king is a threat to his throne. If he's over this region, including Jerusalem, Israel, then this king that is born king of the Jews may very well rise up and usurp his power by force and removing him from king, killing him ultimately. And so that's the truth of what's going on in his head. Does he want to go and worship the king? No, he doesn't. Verse 9, when they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And so first, they see a star. The star clues them in that the Messiah is being born. They go to Jerusalem, inquire of King Herod, hey, where, where's the Messiah supposed to be born? He brings in the chief religious leaders, finds out it's Bethlehem. Now this star is miraculously guiding them. Kind of like the pillar of fire at night and the, is it the sun in the day that, or the cloud? The cloud in the day that would lead the nation of Israel. So it's more than just signs in the sky. It's actual miraculous things are taking place to be able to guide them step by step, I find that interesting. Verse 11, and when they had come into the house, so it's not the manger where the wise men come, right? They come into the house, they saw the young child, not the baby, the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented, him, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense and myrrh, gold speaking of uh, the deity of Christ and also speaking of the fact that he would be king, frankincense, speaking of the fact that he would be priest and his prayers would ascend to the Father on behalf of the people. And then um, myrrh is, oh, there's only one thing we did with myrrh and that's embalming agent where he was born to die. Verse 12, then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. Again, begin to make a note, just an observation that God is revealing himself to certain people, but he's withholding the revelation to
to certain other people. And I think that's critical, again, as I was going through this. So these wise men, the Magi and who they were, number one, they read and believed God's word. Number two, they sought Jesus. Number three, they recognized the worth of Christ. Number four, they humbled themselves to worship Jesus. And number five, they obeyed God rather than man. They were truly wise men and not just wise guys. Okay. All right. Let's jump over to Luke's gospel chapter two. We're going to see another group of people here. We'll look at three other groups of people. And then from there, we'll tie in what I was observing this week. So this is, let's see, Zacharias and Elizabeth, Luke's gospel. Notice verses, chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Notice, and they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. And so a godly older couple where Mary and Joseph would probably be in their late teens at the birth of Jesus, Elizabeth and Zacharias, her husband, would be older and they would be barren, no children. But somewhere long, 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 long ago in their past, they prayed to God that they would have children. And so we need to remember that God remembers our prayers. Maybe things that we've forgotten God has not forgotten. And in God's timing, when it's the right time, God is going to address this. And so Zacharias, he's a priest that serves in the temple. And his lot falls where he's able to offer incense in the temple as what they did is, is in practicing prayers in first century AD. And so as he's in the temple setting up the um, ash, what is it, the... Um, not... The incense. Oh. Um, the angel Gabriel comes to him and he tells them that you and your wife Elizabeth are going to bring forth the forerunner to the Messiah. And he's incredulous. He can't believe it. He's thinking, ah, we're really old. And yeah, we prayed that a long time ago and probably not going to happen. In that, the angel says, because you didn't believe me, I'm going to take your voice away. You're not going to be able to speak until it takes place. And so he lingers in the temple, takes longer than he should as he's setting up whatever and has this encounter. And he comes out with hand motions trying to tell the people, I saw an angel. You're not going to believe this. And it was crazy. And he told me that we're going to have a baby. My wife's going to be like that. And I don't know how he's exactly doing that. But the people are like, well, he's trying to gesture us and show us. And, but he can't talk. What's going on? And so all the way up until John the Baptist is born, that takes place where he doesn't have a voice, but it happens exactly as God uh, declared that it would happen. Now jump over to Luke's gospel, same, same book, chapter 2, and notice with me uh, verses 8 through 20. Luke's gospel, chapter 2, starting at verse 8. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. So they're not just afraid, they're greatly afraid. Verse 10, Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now, when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things 
that they had heard and seen as it was told to them. Again, in the midst of revealing what's going to happen to these shepherds, remember now, shepherds are unclean. Shepherds didn't have a right to go to temple, so they couldn't go to church. But yet God chose to reveal himself to these shepherds in a field. Why these shepherds? Why shepherds? People who were considered unclean and couldn't go to um, temple. Don't know. Inquiring minds want to know. We'll see. Simeon, we're going to look at. Notice Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, starting at verse 25. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And so once again, you have a man that is ready to die. But before he dies, he was told, you're going to see the Christ. You're going to see the Messiah. And so this, this is the promise fulfilled. Verse 26, and it ha had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and, your, and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And so here in Simeon, we learn that God's promise to him is fulfilled. He got to see the Christ. He takes the child, yeah, not a baby, but a child, as they brought him into the temple to present. So he's at least eight days or older, okay? Because at eight days old, you would present your child uh, in the temple to the Lord. The first male that breaks the womb, it says... Uh, in the law. And so in that, again, Mary is just taking all of this stuff in. Man, a, a, a sword is going to pierce my side. We would see that take place, right, when Mary would be at the foot of the cross and Jesus dying on the cross, and she would see the fulfillment of what Simeon was prophesying. Our last person is Anna, a prophetess. Notice Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, starting at verse 36. Now there was one, Anna, a prophetess, a daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. So she's married for seven years and then her husband passes away. Notice, and this woman was a widow of about 84 years who did not depart from the temple but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. So Anna, a prophetess, would minister for God and minister to God. She would not just do one. Verse 38, And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him, spoke of him to all those who looked for the redemption in, in Jerusalem. Okay? So look at these individuals that we have. We have a young couple, Mary and Joseph, godly couple. Um, accusations and murmurings and all of this stuff is going to surround them their entire lives. It is believed that Joseph would die at some point before Jesus would begin his ministry because something of significance Jesus would have included. One of the gospel writers would have included it. And when Jesus is on the cross, he's going to declare to John the Baptist, behold your mother, and mother, behold your son. And from that point on, the Bible says that John the Baptist, not John the Baptist, the Apostle John, I'm sorry, John the Baptist would die pretty early. Uh, but the Apostle John would go ahead and take uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, into his home and take care of her. And she's seen in the upper room with the twelve. Uh, but as far as Joseph is concerned, Again, sometime before, sometime after eight years old, because Jesus is brought into the temple and he's confounding the religious leaders at eight years old as he's uh, just 
pouring out wisdom and they're just amazed. Uh, but Joseph and Mary are in that company. So again, somewhere in between that time. So you have Joseph and Mary, again, a young, godly couple that love the Lord, and they're chosen to bring forth, if you will, the Messiah to raise him. Jesus wasn't born in a palace. He wasn't born to aristocratic families or lineage. He was born to common folk, in fact, very poor. We know that Mary and Joseph were poor because when they present Jesus um, at eight days, they bring the least costly gift that they can present, two turtle doves. And that would be like rubbing two nickels together and seeing if you can screech a dollar out of it. And so we know that Jesus was born in those conditions. When the Magi come, they give gold, and so that gold would help them with their uh, move to Egypt, and they would be able to accomplish that. Uh, but as far as themselves, they had not much. Um, Zacharias and Elizabeth, an older couple that again were godly, and God chooses to use them to bring forth the forerunner, John the Baptist, and um, to fulfill a prayer that had been probably uttered a long, long, long time ago in their life. But nonetheless, God hears our prayers. Uh, the shepherds out in the field, God, for whatever reason, decides to reveal to these shepherds that a Messiah is born and that they can go and see this manger scene. Uh, Simeon, this just and devout guy that's waiting for this promise that was given to him. And again, he's a religious guy. He's a pious person. He is just and devout, but um, was waiting for this promise, and he gets it. Anna, a prophetess, and it says that she did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. But then again, there's the religious leaders that God didn't reveal this to. And now you begin to kind of scratch your head and say, okay, wait, he's revealing himself to these other people, but the very religious leaders that would know that the Messiah is to be born because of the scripture in Malachi, Malachi, no, Micah. It's prophesied in Micah that he would be born in Bethlehem, but not revealed. Jesus was not revealed to them. You look at the king. He gets wind of it, and his only motivation is, i got to wipe this guy out. And so he gets wind, okay, when did you see the star? He starts doing the math, and because they tricked him, if you will, because God said, don't go back to the king, don't tell him where the Messiah is, um, he ends up killing all the children, two years old and under. And so his motivation wasn't to see the king for a good reason, so God doesn't reveal himself to him. Now, as I'm reading through this, I'm thinking to myself, okay, why are you revealing yourself to some and not to others? Five-point Calvinism has within its belief system that we do not have a free will. I believe that we do. And so therefore, I do not believe in five-point Calvinism, that we don't have a free will. And this is where I get it from. God is revealing himself to a certain group of people, but he's withholding information from another certain group of people. And so I want you to picture now the sun shining in the sky, the S-U-N. And I want you to picture two elements in that sun, if you will. You have clay and you have wax. That sun that beats on both of those elements has a different reaction to both of those elements based on the elements themselves. The same sun that hardens the clay melts the wax. It's the condition, if you will, of the material. And so the Bible tells us that God will reveal himself to us to the degree that we desire him to. He will not force himself upon us. The difficulties that we go through in life are created to get us to look up to God. We can so choose to look away from God in those moments and that reveals the condition of our heart. And if I were honest with you, I would say we do both. Sometimes we do look away and we grow bitter and we begin to get hardened. And sometimes we do look to God and we are softened and we grow better as opposed to bitter. It's the condition of our heart. You say, Johnny, where do you get this from? I get this from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13. Jesus would begin his parabolic ministry in Matthew chapter 13. 
And the disciples would come to him after he shares parables. And he, they would ask the question, why do you speak in parables? And he says, because seeing they will not see, and hearing they will not hear, because that which is spoken from the prophet Isaiah is true in their lives. They don't want to hear. Therefore, I do not give them what they don't want to receive. And so we need to be very careful that in the midst of the difficulties, in the midst of the circumstances, in the midst of the trials, in the midst of the pain, that we look to God. And what it's going to create in our lives is a maturity. And we're going to grow better. And we're going to grow in meekness and humility. But when we begin to look away from God, then we are left to our own devices. And eventually and inevitably, we will grow bitter. And people will see it. And so you have these grumpy old men. Where do grumpy old men come from? They come from looking away from God and life has hurt them. Life has damaged them. Life has made them bitter as opposed to better. And so I find that interesting of a dynamic that the same sun that hardens the clay melts the wax. God will not force himself upon you. God will not force himself upon me. God leaves me volition, the free will to choose. God, this hurts. God, this is painful. God, I don't like this. But I'm making a conscious choice to look to you in the midst of what's going on. And then God begins to show himself strong. And what we discover is, He's everything that I needed all along. It was him that I needed. God is the becoming one. Interesting, twice in the scriptures it says, and you will call his name Jesus. What's in a name? Jesus, the savior of the world. Pastor Chuck Smith does a study, an entire study on the names of God. And then he takes all of the Old Testament um, idols, Baal, Ashtaroth, all these false idols that were set up in, in the surrounding nations where Israel was. And he says they're alive and well today. The God of pleasure, the God of money, the God of power. All of these um, in, things that, that we worship and bow down to today. Alive and well. And then he takes God. And it's interesting, the Bible declares... In the first commandment in Exodus chapter 20, you shall have no other gods above me. These gods make great servants, but horrible masters. Great servants. Money is a great servant, but a horrible master. And if we live for money, we will begin to bow down and it will rip us off every time. And the shrines that exist, Pastor Chuck was going through these shrines. You look at Las Vegas and money and how it's just elevated. And, and Las Vegas is made to do one thing. It's made to take your money. Yeah. It's to, made to keep your money. But the pleasure. And look at the temples, all these buildings that they have and all this stuff. And so he does, like I said, a great job of just revealing this. The God of power, and we see it in politics, and we're... we're Right is wrong, wrong is right, but people don't care as long as, you know, we're looking to the government, if you will, as our savior. These idols that are resurrected in the world today. And so it goes on and on. The holy name of God in the Old Testament is, it ends up being translated into Jehovah. And what it comes down to is, it comes down to that which we need him to be. God will be that which we need him to be. When we need comfort, he is our comfort. When we need strength, he is our strength. When we need provision, he is our provision. When we need peace, he is our peace. Jehovah Shalom, our peace. And so we can elevate these idols that exist, these false gods that exist in the world, but they will overpromise and underdeliver every single time. Be careful what we live for. Again, the choice is ours and God leaves the choice up to us. And sometimes, you know what, I think we'll get it right. And sometimes we can look back and reflect and say, wow, I set up an idol. I set something up above God in that moment that it had to look like this and it had to be like this. 
And instead of looking to God because of the pain and the hurt that I was in, I began to look away from God and I began to believe the lies that were being whispered in my ears. And so we have that choice in those moments to reflect and say, ah, been there, done that, bought the t-shirt, didn't like it, didn't fit right. And we can look to God at any moment. God leaves that choice up to us. And in the midst of that, what we will find is maybe life is not moving in the direction that I so hope to, right? Zacharias and Elizabeth could have said, but God had something bigger in mind for them, did he not? And Mary would have this thing hovering over her her whole life, but God had something bigger than just her reputation and what people thought of her. Today, she is venerated, and rightly so. I think Protestants undermine Mary, and I think Catholicism elevates her to an unhealthy degree. She is a godly woman, a model of godliness, that we should stand back and say, wow, I can pattern my life after this young woman who loved God to the extent that God chose her to bring forth the Savior. And all of these people, as we look at them, the shepherds and, and, and um, what's that dude's name? Simeon. Simeon and Anna, a prophetess, and these different people. And we can say, wow, these are examples. I'll close with this. We have a tendency to want to make our testimony bigger or smaller than it needs to be. The reality of a testimony is not pointing to you. The reality of a testimony is supposed to be pointing to God. So the glory is supposed to go to God. We think, well, it, it, I've, got, I've got to be a prostitute or I've got to be some, you know, some rancid drug dealer. Or I've got to be like a murderer. And then, ooh, God will get a lot of glory. Uh, how much glory does God need that you were dead and now you're alive? Not a whole lot. All of us, the Bible declares, all of us were dead in trespasses and sins. And so may we be careful. I, I, I listen to testimonies and sometimes the me part is about this long and then the God part is like, like about that long and you're like, whoa, what's this testimony about? This testimony is supposed to point to God. This testimony is supposed to be, I was a rotten scoundrel no matter how good or bad I was in comparison to others because I was dead in my trespasses and sins. That should be about this small. And then God. And guess what? God is still putting up with me. And God is still patient with me. And God is still delivering me. And God is still revealing things to me. To God be the glory. And so we need to be careful to think. Pastor Chuck Smith's testimony was he never drank alcohol. A cigarette never touched his lips. A curse word never came out of his lips. And yet he was dead in trespasses and sins and realized he needed a savior. Because without Jesus, he was going to hell. And he surrendered his life to God. And that's a phenomenal testimony. And his testimony was, God kept me from a lot of junk that I didn't need to experience. And then our testimony may be, I was a prostitute, and I was a drug dealer, and I was a murderer, and whatever. But to God be the glory. And so we need to be careful that God is going to reveal himself to not us as we get ready and prepare and, and fix things up and do all of that. No, no. God's going to meet us where we're at. But we have to ask ourselves, what's the condition of my heart? Do I want God to reveal himself to me? And to what degree do I desire that God would reveal himself to me? That choice, I believe, lies with us. Because God will not outgive any one of us. If we so desire that God would reveal himself to us, get ready. Some of it's uncomfortable. Some of it's awkward, right? Whoa, God, you're, you're showing me things about me that I don't know if I was ready to receive. Okay, Whew, I guess if you're showing them to me, then maybe I am ready to receive them. But then we can surrender those things to the Lord. We can reveal those things to the Lord and say, Lord, man, can you help me? Can you help me change, address some of these things that you're revealing? To me, God's, yeah, because you want me to. But I'm not going to force myself upon you. Again, look at the players, look at the individuals that we saw. Jesus, so, God, the Father, so chose to reveal Jesus to in his birth. Nothing changes. Do you desire that God reveal himself to you? Then he will. Do you not? Then he won't. He will not force himself upon anybody. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. 
Lord, to the degree that we desire you to reveal yourself to us, Lord, but that light and darkness cannot coexist. So in the midst of that, Lord, we have to be ready to walk in meekness and humility, coming in contact with the perfect one, with the risen Lord. And so thank you, Lord, for the birth, the death, burial, and resurrection of this one that came to die, for that is life. And continue, Lord, to show us and reveal yourself to us as we can endure and take it in. Lord, our desire is to truly grow better and not bitter. And so, Lord, if we've, for whatever reason, allowed bitterness to creep into our hearts, Father, we ask for forgiveness. We repent, Lord. We ask that you would forgive us of that and that we would desire, Lord, that you reveal yourself to us in mighty and powerful ways that we would grow in the grace and knowledge of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand for this last song, please.